This talk is about uh, anti-patterns. I might, I might talk about test smells. So what I mean by, by test smell is that it's, uh, uh, it's some kind of a hint. Uh, it might be this, the shape of something or the name or some kind of a, uh, a pain or uh, feeling I get from, from code, in this case test code, uh, that suggests there, there might be an issue. Uh, so it's not an absolute, yes, that's a problem. It's more like uh, there's something funky about this. Uh, I should like, look at it and, and uh, see if there is something behind. Uh, not necessarily, but that might be the case. So uh, I'm, a, I'm a programmer by background, uh, also a trainer, uh, coach. Uh, I, I work at a consultancy, when, and basically I spend half of my time working with code, half of my time with uh, you know, methodology. So uh, this is clearly based on the, the, the other half, where I, I worked with code in a bunch of different organizations and uh, sort of lucky to get exposure to all kinds of code bases. Mostly Java and the examples are Java, uh, but I think that this, these uh, anti-patterns apply to many languages, not just object-oriented languages, uh, many others as well. So here's, uh, uh, here's an, uh, a piece of the abstract. Uh, if you read the abstract for the session, uh, I'd just like to point out the, the, the really important parts of the abstract. Um, tests need to be maintained. And that's, uh, you know, you hear a lot about uh, when you start talking about uh, thorough unit tests or other kinds of automated tests. Uh, one of the main concerns uh, that seems to raise is, isn't that a lot of code to maintain? Isn't it a burden if, if we write so many tests? That's, that's actually exactly what we're trying to avoid by uh, being able to identify and fix test smells. The fact that tests are unmaintainable, that's, that is the ultimate test smell. Uh, so we're, uh, we're going to look at uh, a few uh, particular sort of names for things that I, I, I've given or somebody else has given and some heuristics around how to, how to think about these things. Now, we're talking about smells, which, which means it's not an absolute, this is good and this is bad. Sometimes what's good in one context, you uh, go to the next source file, and you know, there the good, the so-called so good structure or good design is actually a really bad idea. And you, you do the exact opposite refactoring in a different source file. And it, that's, that's a good idea in that context. Um, so this is going to be a, a kind of a walkthrough of a few samples. Uh, I've categorized them into four different groups. Uh, we'll start from the top left corner, talk about uh, smells related to how you check things. So assertions uh, in, in a test framework language. Uh, then we'll talk about how we organize code, uh, test code. Uh, between classes, methods, and so forth. Uh, then we'll, uh, we'll go through uh, the, the bottom half. And uh, I've got examples of each. They're, again, they're Java, but I think you'll, you'll follow even though you're not maybe a Java programmer. So let's start with the first assertion. It's called, uh, the smell is called primitive assertion. Now here's the sample of it. Uh, there's something Something I think is wrong about this code. It, I, I call it primitive assertion. How would you uh, describe it? What's the problem here? Has something to do with the assertion? Anyone? Sorry? It, It'll be always false. Um, uh, so there's nothing wrong with the, I mean, this test will pass. Let's just assume that. Um, there's something about how we're making the assertion that's, that's uh, the problem. Now, I call it primitive assertion. 
And I call it primitive because what we're asserting is that uh, uh, evaluating certain type of uh, script should produce certain type of output. Now, in, when I describe what, what we're testing, none of, none of those words included numbers like one, minus one, zero, anything like that. We, we talk about uh, strings conceptually, not numbers. So the whole uh, assertion about what's the index of a certain string, that's too primitive for our purposes. So it's, it might not be a problem at this, uh, this scale, but if you have uh, thousands of tests and everywhere you use slightly too primitive concepts to express your intent, that might become a, a, a really big burden over time. Because any code you look at is too primitive. You always have to first scan it through and then, oh yeah, that's what it's doing. It's not n immediately obvious. Um, so I changed it a bit. Uh, here's an example uh, of a slightly better way to do the same assertion using a slightly different API. So these are J units, but um, basically uh, expressing the same thing using words that are closer to the, the concept domain. Uh, we're asserting that output contains a certain string. It's much, much better in my opinion. So uh, that was a primitive assertion. There's another assertion uh, smell that I'd like to point out. I think this might be uh, something you've also seen. Uh, it's called broad assertion, and this requires a bit of explanation. So uh, the following example is from a, from a system I worked on uh, well, a decade ago. Um, this was for a medical company, so a drugs development company. So they, uh, what their business is, is basically coming up with a drug and then trying to pitch the drug to doctors because it's the doctors who prescribe and basically market the drug to consumers. So uh, the company was concerned that their, uh, their sort of sales force, the people who r r go and talk to the doctors, uh, give out samples and so forth, that uh, they're not actually selling the product. They're just uh, recording hours, logging hours, and uh, they're not actually talking to doctors. They're home playing PlayStation and you know, cashing in uh, uh, the, the paycheck. So you know, slightly uh, paranoid, but you know, I, I was young and foolish and wanted to help the evil corporation. So uh, I set out to implement a, a desktop application that was running on the sales reps uh, computers. And uh, so we embedded in all of the sales presentations, the uh, drug presentations, we embedded a small, uh, a uh, small sort of uh, active component that continually sent information to uh, uh, a small piece of server software running on the Windows operating system and uh, basically logging what, what slide are we displaying of which presentation. And then what, the next time the computer had a network access, they would upload that information to the server. So uh, in short, we are collecting a log file over here and then we're pushing it to the server when we have internet. Now, the, uh, one of the challenges was that uh, uh, we were the, the log file produced by the, uh, the component we embedded into the presentations and the, uh, the, the log file format expected by the server was slightly different. So we, uh, we were doing a small trans translation or transformation uh, on the client side just before uploading. And that's what the next code is, code is about. So here's a, a test that I, I wrote some, some time ago. It, uh, that was uh, you know, not using JUnit 4. So I've translated it into a, an API that you know, people generally recognize. But uh, the, the uh, approach was the same. So uh, we, we have a couple of uh, strings that we deal with here in the test. Uh, input file and expected output. Uh, so th these are the actual, the actual content, not uh, file paths or anything like that. We had one setup method that uh, said create input file. And here you can see how the, the string builder is, uh, sort of accumulates the, uh, the, the sort of stuff that we have in the input file 
the log file produced by the presentation. Um, and then uh, we had another setup method which set up the, the expected output. So after the transformation, what should we uh, have? And, and this is what we were supposed to upload to the server. So uh, similar, uh, similar information, or actually the same information, but in a slightly similar, but also slightly different uh, format. So for example, we didn't put timestamps over here, but screen durations and uh, the f overall file structure was a bit different. Uh, so those were the setup things, setup input and output. And then we had uh, a test. The test said transformation generates right stuff into the right file. And uh, um, you can read from this test what it's doing. Uh, I'm, I'm saying that this has a smell, this test has a smell that I call uh, a broad assertion. I'll give you a, a, a moment to try and imagine why might I call it broad assertion. Yes, it's testing so many things uh, that if, if the test fails, I just know that there was some kind of a difference between the input and output. And now this uh, might be manageable it's, it's only what, uh, 10 to 15 lines of uh, data on each, uh, like expected and actual. So it, it's not impossible to figure out what the difference was. But it does take a lot of uh, effort to, to dig in and uh, figure out what's going on. There's another, uh, another problem with this. It relates to the, the breadth of the, uh, the data we're comparing. Sorry, the, the, uh, sorry, the hum is so loud. I it's the oh, these. Uh, it doesn't have to do with the files. No, it has to do with the contents of the files being uh, fairly uh, big chunks. So um, it's not just that when something goes wrong, it's uh, it's sort of hard to figure out what went wrong, um, but it is that it goes wrong very easily. So anything small that changes anywhere in the, the log file formats, this test will fail. So uh, contrast this to uh, having more specific tests, uh, m multiple of them, that each would only test one particular aspect and not fail if some other aspect fa uh, is changed. So here's uh, uh, a, like one step uh, towards uh, what I think, well, at least away from this particular smell. Um, having separate tests for uh, the screen durations being uh, produced correctly. So in this test we're, oh, sorry, I, I shouldn't touch that. In this test we're basically creating a very simple um, log file uh, using a, a small utility. So in the setup, we're actually setting up like the surroundings for the log file. And then when we say transform, this little helper method here, here will take, our, take this content and wrap it inside the overall structure for, for the log file. So in our test, we only see the relevant bits in the test method. And also, we're, we're simply uh, sort of fuzzily comparing that you know, there should be a, the word started uh, towards you know, the beginning of the file and uh, uh, finished in towards the end. And somewhere in between, there should be screen one. So just that the structure is sort of correct. Uh, very fuzzy. It's not very, uh, not very specific. So there, the, there are things or changes that might be are falling between the cracks with this approach. Um, and then some of those, those other things might be caught by a different test. So for example here, this is just the screen durations being calculated and rendered appropriately. So you have uh, three timestamps and then based on those timestamps you should calculate certain numbers over here. Again, specific to 
some parts of the, out the transformation output, um, something else might be changed, this test wouldn't notice. As long as those other things are covered by a different test, uh, that should be okay. So those were a couple of uh, assertion-related smells. There, there are a bunch of others, um, but I, th I thought I, I'd sort of pick a couple that I find fairly common. Doing uh, two detailed primitive things and doing two broad uh, sort of universal comparisons. Usually it's assert equals when it comes to broad assertions. So uh, uh, let's look at a couple of uh, organization patterns, uh, smells. Uh, this one I call the split personality. Um, and here's an example. Can you identify what's split in this example? Yes, this, this is testing uh, many aspects. So the test has a split personality. On one hand, it's testing this, and on, on the other hand, it's also testing that. Uh, so that's, the, that's where the name comes from. Now, there's also another, uh, slight, maybe uh, even more common uh, test smell, in some code bases at least, the white space. And that's a small hint that there might be something wrong about this test because the programmer felt like he should insert white space in between to you know, separate the, the two concepts. Uh, but yeah, that's, uh, that's a small detail inside this bigger smell. But so yeah, we're, we're testing uh, a whole bunch of command line arguments, passing those to the, command, the configuration object, and then asserting like, the result of, or the effect of all of those uh, flags in a single test. So here's uh, one way to so start pulling those apart. Um, uh, deal with the default options separately, and then basically figure out uh, what, what's the default, for default effect for default configuration. Because in this case, it's kind of hard to say. I mean, we have no idea what the default is for the others. Um, but if you, if you pull out default s separately, that tends to be uh, a good idea. And then uh, verify the effect of certain flags with separate tests. Like, uh, for example, here, explicit options are set correctly. Now, I would still go further. Uh, it wouldn't fit on the slide, but I would still go further and, and uh, verify the effect of each individual flag separate with, with a separate test. What's still missing, conceptually in this case, is uh, the, uh, the combined effect of flags. So what if I have uh, minus f uh, and minus v? Is it significant? Well, uh, I might make the risk judgment that it's, they shouldn't have any effect on each other. I might not test that. But uh, it might be that uh, minus d and minus f have an effect on each other. Now, in that case, I, I might actually want to test that combination explicitly as well. Uh, the same, uh, the, this sort of splitting, uh, splitting the split personality test into each personality having a separate test, that also helps with, in the same way uh, as uh, with prod assertions. When something fails, it pinpoints it more, more specifically. This is what's wrong. Um, it might mean that you have, in absolute terms, more lines of code in your test suite. On the other hand, each, each individual block is easier to grasp and it's easier to reason about. Um, another organization smell uh, that I added here was split logic. Um, this tends to be uh, an issue only in some certain types of code bases. Um, most web applications don't seem to have this, um, but uh, I've seen a, a few, okay, all kinds of various things where this is an, uh, is an issue. So uh, this, this particular smell I found from the JRuby uh, project. JRuby is an open source implementation of the Ruby language and interpreter on, on the JVM. And, uh, 
if you're looking for uh, samples for bad code, I'd, I'd say JRuby, unfortunately, is a fairly good source. Um, it's, not very, it's not very good code, in my opinion. Uh, although I love the, the product as such, the code, code is awful. So, uh, oops, one of the, uh, one of the uh, classes in, in this JRuby project is uh, a class called Ruby, which is uh, kind of a, a, a higher level object in the system, which represents the runtime. So you can tell the a Ruby object to evaluate certain code or interpret certain code. So that's what we're testing here. Uh, the test was called variables and methods. And it, it's a one-liner that says eval this piece of Ruby code. And then uh, uh, that should load some kind of a source file. And then a bunch of assertions that compare the, uh, the result of a, a different eval to some expected output. Can you tell what the split logic issue here is? What's the logic that's being split? Uh, loading of the file. The file, the, the external file does relate. What is it about the file? Uh, well, yeah, the file might not exist. Uh, it's, it's not quite that. That, that would be an issue. Uh, luckily, we'd find out probably uh, through some kind of an exception. Uh, let me ask you a, another question. Um, why should this piece of uh, Ruby code evaluate to hello world? Why should this evaluate to hello world in reverse? So it's not quite obvious from the test uh, because, well, because of, uh, you know, we're testing something that's very like, non-domain related to us. Um, but because the, half of the logic of the test is, is inside an external source file. So we've split the test's uh, logic into two source files, so we have to switch back and forth. Well, and what's even worse is probably when this happens, uh, and you, for example, you double click into, um, into this source file in your IDE, the odds are that your IDE actually opens as a separate text editor unless you've con uh, added all kinds of plugins in there. But that's specific to the JRuby project. Um, so we, wh whenever we do something with this test, if, if it fails, we have to look at the source, this source file and the other source file. Uh, if we change the test, the same thing. We need to go back and forth. Uh, so clearly not so good. This is what, what's inside the variables method, uh, variables and methods uh, Ruby file and a bunch of calculations is being done there. So one way to, uh, to solve this would be what? Yeah, just put them into the same source file. Uh, here's one way to do it. Uh, there's several, of course. Uh, you might create some kind of a utility. I, I call it appendable file. And, the, and I, I, had, I wanted this, uh, this utility because I didn't want to deal with uh, line feed characters. I, uh, I thought that this might be useful because there was a lot of things that you know, were, were going on there. Uh, and that made, that made the source listing too long to fit on the slide using a decent sized font. So uh, simplified it a bit. Uh, at least this would bring this, the logic into the same, same test method. Can you see a, a, a problem with this, this test method? Uh, st too many string constants. Technically, there are, aren't any constants. No, but well, because I mean to say, like, a lot, lot of hard-coded yeah. strings, you know, which, <coughs> the, which has the name A, B, C, D, E, and E. We are testing too much of things. We're testing too many things. So, uh, so what's this smell called? Split personality, yeah. Um, so, w that, and this t tends to happen. It's just like refactoring. When you refactor, uh, one shape to another, the new shape might have something to refactor. 
And you know, the same with test smells. Once you get rid of one smell, you might uncover another smell, or you might basically uh, exchange one smell to, the, to another. Um, and this is why I sometimes end up like, reversing or reverting a refactoring, because I realize that actually this isn't much better. It's actually slightly worse. Uh, so I, I, if I can't find a way to refactor further, I might actually backtrack a bit. The same with test models. So here's uh, how you might go about it. Uh, separate the concepts, uh, separate test for variable assignments, and separate test for method invocations. Uh, and you might go even further, but uh, that's, that's generally the idea. So let's talk about uh, transparency. Um, when I say transparency, I'm, I'm referring to transparency as in uh, the, the reader of the code uh, sees uh, what's going on and why it's going on. Um, the, fir the first sample I, I called setup sermon, as in, uh, you know, you go to, I'm not, sure, I'm not, I'm not very religious, um, but in Finland we have a tradition to go to the church uh, once or twice a year. And, you know, especially uh, if you look at small kids, you know, it's like, it's a tradition, so you bring the kids and they don't understand what's going on, and then the, the priest goes on and starts like, speaking at them. They, they, they couldn't care less, and the priest is using awkward words. They, they're totally foreign, you un don't understand what he's saying. So they doze off, and the same happens with programmers with certain kinds of code. Uh, here's an example, it's slightly uh, small font size, but I'd like you to try and figure out what this setup method is doing. Once you can put that into words, please uh, say it out loud. What's, what is this setup method setting up? So, so far we have reads XML, populates some objects. What else? So, it uses the file system to set up stuff over there. Yeah. It has uh, three, three present. Okay, so now we're getting close. Uh, can you repeat the three aspects? You said uh, three aspects. Reading, the XML file. Reading an XML file. In this case, it's called a catalog or a manifest, yeah? Then based on that XML, is uh, getting a missing resource? It's, uh, uh, let it's uh, getting a list of missing uh, resources, yes? Then and third, And, and it uh, gets a list of uh, downloads based on the, the manifest that, that uh, uh, a list of missing packages. So conceptually, there are three things going on, but that's uh, you know, none of those concepts are very obvious, uh, at least not very visible in this, this setup. So if we're conceptually talking about three steps, why, why isn't that a three-line method? And that's, that's exactly the, uh, the setup sermon thing. This happens a lot with setup methods, particularly. Um, with, test, uh, with test methods, you know, we, we already saw the split personality uh, thing, which is uh, kind of a, the similar problem, but for a different reason. We're trying to test too many things in, in one test. Um, but even when you split those into separate tests, a lot of the times you still have the similar problem in your setup, which is you're setting up a lot of things in a single method. It's not that you shouldn't set them up in a single method necessarily, 
Um, especially if you need to do these, uh, these things in a certain order, it might be very good to have just a single setup method rather than three separate setup methods. But you, you do want to uh, have the method be transparent so that the intent, the purpose uh, is visible. Um, so here's uh, one possible way to refactor that. Um, extract a couple of private methods. Uh, you know, we can create the package fetcher, whatever it is. That's like, uh, not necessarily, you, you don't necessarily have to do this in an ex, uh, a private method. It's a, it's a one-liner, fairly high-level operation. And then we create a temp directory, and then we extract missing downloads from a certain XML file. That's more or less the, uh, the sort of same conceptual uh, abstraction level. And then you know, all of the details of how, how we create the temp there, where the temp directory is physically, um, how do we extract the missing downloads, uh, that's, that might be relevant sometimes, but you can easily find it uh, by control clicking over there when necessary. Um, Another uh, uh, form of missing transparency or not having enough transparency is the, uh, is the big string. And this is, again, XML, so I, I apologize for making your head hurt. Um, the, uh, the previous example, uh, the, the X, parsing the XML file, uh, getting a list of missing resources and so forth, that came from the same uh, uh, drug company, the, the code base that I made for the evil drug company. Um, this is also from the same, the same code base. This is the, the actual contents of the XML file. So uh, you can't read this, but that's a setup method. It starts over here and continues over here, uh, co basically appending to a string buf buffer, building up a, a, the XML contents of the, the manifest file. And it doesn't stop there. Uh, that the method doesn't stop there. There's another uh, piece of XML. That's actually when we've uh, managed to create the um, the uh, like first of two versions of the manifest, and then we start setting creating a second version, a variation of the the same manifest file, and it continues all the way until here. So basically what these are is uh, the ma version of the manifest on the client, the version of the manifest on the server, th then uh, there's a difference. Therefore, we need to do an update and download missing resources. So uh, here's uh, an alternative that uh, I think if you're using XML, that you might, might want to consider. Uh, using some kind of a builder pattern. Uh, for example, this is a hand-built uh, builder object called product catalog XML builder. Uh, now, product catalog, catalog is a synonym for manifest. So, uh, we create this builder and then we use uh, somewhat fluent API for adding products with presentations um, instead of actually dictating the exact XML format. Now, this has a few benefits. Uh, whenever we change the structure of the, the, the manifest file, we don't have to go, go through all of these tests because it's all uh, encapsulated inside the builder object. We only need to update the builder to generate the proper XML. Um, second, it's more visible. What does the manifest contain? From here, it's next to, next to impossible to, to sort of figure out what products are in there and what are the, res the relationships between them. The more levels you have, the in indentation levels, the more chances that you, you know, your, sort of your eyes don't quite align things correctly and you think that uh, product A contains not just two presentations, actually contains three because one of the lines was uh, s uh, so far away that you kind of misaligned it. It's quite difficult to keep track of, but this is fairly simple. Um, there is something that you, you, we, we probably should do further. Um, what the heck does false mean? Uh, the, uh, you, you might want to take this even further, uh, but again, this is just for uh, 
to fit on the slide easily, um, you, at least you probably get the idea. Now in this case I have uh, also two separate uh, builder instances and, 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 and the, uh, the infamous white space in between, which might suggest that I actually might want to do two setups. Now these, these things also don't have a dependency. I can create this before this or the other way around. It doesn't matter. So what I'd probably do next is split this setup into two and call them maybe uh, create local catalog and create server catalog or something more descriptive. Um, does anyone have, an, have experience with builder objects? or uh, factory objects, yeah? Are you, uh, by the way, are you using Ruby by any chance? No? Okay. Because this is, uh, it's fairly established in the Ruby community. You have a whole bunch of uh, third-party libraries that for, you know, creating objects like this in a, use, uh, in a sort of concise manner for testing purposes. But it's less common with uh, Java and C-sharp and so forth. So that's actually, I, I'm very happy that it's not just Ruby people who, who do this. Um, let's look at maintainability things. Um, the first one is called absolute file path, and I think you've seen this. What's wrong with this test? Same as depends on the uh, it depends on the, the location of your workspace. Um, so some of the ways that, uh, this uh, impacts your, your developers or fellow developers is that um, everybody has to have the, you know, the project checked out into the same location. Otherwise, uh, you know, it just doesn't work. This test will fail. Um, another uh, thing that a lot of people don't realize is that you, you can only have one version of the product, the project checked out. Now, if you're doing, uh, if you're working on uh, the like development branch and then some kind of a, a maintenance branch, you know, what do you do when you need to uh, fix a bug? It's, it gets uh, awkward. So it's it's not a very small issue. It's actually a big issue. Now, luckily, the the solutions are also trivial. Um, so the first thing in Java would be to uh, consider a relative path. Yeah. Now, uh, this would no longer depend on, first of all, Windows. Uh, I can also use this on a Linux and a Mac, uh, and it, it would work. Uh, also, it doesn't anymore depend on the location of the project uh, directory. So I can have several uh, versions checked out or several branches checked out. Um, can you think of any other way to get rid of the problem? What else could you do than use relative path? Sorry, mark. Uh, mock the XML file. Um, so, well, we could we could build the XML in uh, in source code in with Java code around here. Um, that might be an option. Yes. The the trick is if we if we're testing something that uh, that we want uh, to use the file API, then we might want to actually have the file in in place. Um, but it, that's a very good option. Anything else? Any other ideas? Sorry? Properties? Sorry, I still can't hear with that. Configuration properties? Uh, that, might be, that might give you uh, another way to get rid of the absolute part. Uh, it, the added complication would be that everybody has to maintain their property file. Um, might be a, a, a reasonable way to get rid of a situation if for some reason, for example, if you're using an API that for some reason doesn't uh, accept relative paths, it, it requires an absolute path, uh, that might be a, a, a way out of it. So uh, another, uh, another thing that you might consider is using the class loader. So if, if you're test data is part of the source packages or uh, source test resources, whatever. It's actually uh, in, the, in your class path in Java. So you might also use uh, 
something like this, uh, asking the class loader to, to give the resource and read it from, the, from a stream or something. This would have the, uh, the relative benefit that it, you can actually move the class around. As long as you move the, uh, uh, the, the, test, the, the uh, catalog XML as well, as you move the class, you can move it to a different package, a different source tree altogether, and it'll still work. You don't have to go and edit the text, edit, edit the literal string. Minor difference, but uh, might be useful. So uh, the last sample I, I wanted to show is what I call pixel perfection. Uh, this is also crap that I wrote 10 years ago. Um, and uh, to give you some background, uh, this was a, like a graphical editor. So um, think of boxes and lines. Boxes are connected with lines. Um, it's like a, a, a trivial graph editor in, in a sense. Now, I was, uh, I was, I was concerned with um, our, our graphs being rendered properly on the screen so that it's visually OK. And uh, the, uh, one of the tests that I wrote looked like this. There's, uh, there, there are two boxes at certain coordinates, oh sorry, uh, with certain sizes. Uh, then we create a diagram, add the two boxes there with, at certain coordinates, and then we render the diagram on a, on a buffered image. Uh, and then we assert all kinds of things. So what's wrong with this? It's very fragile. Um, so, in this particular case, we're talking about uh, fairly simple uh, square, not square, rectangular shapes. Uh, so it's not like uh, it's so sensitive to the, the width or the height of the box. Um, but for example, uh, it's very sensitive to uh, unrelated changes. If we're changing something about the size of the box, obviously we uh, we need to change this, but it's not just that. If we change the, the uh, thickness of the border or the padding of the elements, which kind of shouldn't relate to whether a box is connected or not, still this test would break. So it's, it's, it's very quite fragile indeed. Now, uh, can you figure out an, uh, another way to test this? Test that the two boxes connected with a uh, or connected are indeed rendered with a connecting line. How else could we test this? Uh, you compare top and bottom of the boxes, um, so. That would work if they're always uh, adjacent, so sort of touching each other. But if we're talking about boxes that are separated, there should be a line drawn between them. So what else could we do than check certain pixels that this picture should be white, that should be black? So that, that's very good. Uh, I have given this presentation a few times, and, and uh, you're the first person to actually suggest this. Uh, there's a, there's a uh, downside to it as well. So, uh, and that, that's actually, it's better than this. Uh, it does retain the, uh, some of the same problems as, as this. So uh, to, and let, tell me if, if I got it wrong, but uh, so the idea was that we, um, we might use constants, first of all. And if we place the, uh, the boxes at certain locations, and then we maybe by trying, giving it a shot and seeing how it renders, adjusting the numbers a bit, at some point we might get uh, a completely diagonal arrow line or maybe a completely straight line between the two boxes. And there, therefore we could, we could just point out the starting point and ending point and say, uh, like loop through all of the coordinates in between and that should be black 
anything else should be white. So that, that, that would get rid of a lot of these numbers. Um, so the, the weight might be still vulnerable to or fragile to change, unrelated change, uh, would be that if, if the, uh, again, the shapes change a bit, or if we change the place where the, the line is attached to the box, for example, uh, it's, it's no longer, the lines are not drawn from the center of the box to the, towards the center of the other box, but it's the, let's say, nearest corner of the rectangle, and from there straight to the, the nearest corner of the other rectangle. The, the line would be at different place, and it's, conceptually it's not about the boxes being connected. This test shouldn't break if we change uh, the, the sort of connection points. Uh, True. True. Yeah. So we we could we could also uh, get rid of, rid of this duplication somewhere. We need to uh, tell the, the computer how to recognize a, a line from you know non-line stuff. That's true. So. Uh, Looking at this, uh, so this was code that I wrote, it was actually more than 10 years ago. And uh, once I sort of, I'd scavenged my uh, hard drive for all kinds of crap that I could find, um, this hurt my ego so much that I, tr I wanted to fix it. Even though the, this software is no longer used, uh, it's probably been uh, not unused for 10 years already. Um, so I, I set out to fix this in, in all kinds of ways. So I, I did. Uh, try to d apply simple refactorings like uh, getting rid of, rid of duplication. Um, but I, I could never really get rid of the coordinates. There was always a bit of the coordinates involved, and I, I, I wanted to get rid of those. I call this pixel perfection because it's so uh, specific about the, uh, the coordinates. And uh, this is what I came up with. Um, instead of asserting pixels, I, I decided to start by saying, okay, I, I don't care about the pixels. What I want to do is uh, box one and box two are connected. So I just wrote that into, into the test and deleted all of the coordinates. And then I, I set out to implement this matcher, the connects. And it took a while. Uh, here's the complete implementation for the matcher. So it's, it wasn't trivial. Uh, but I was determined to fix, uh, fix a mistake in the world uh, that I had introduced. And, uh, sorry. Uh, yeah, in, in a sense, yeah. yeah. Yeah, so uh, once, once you start having so much logic in your tests, it, it, it's kind of like you, you also need to test your tests. Um, the, well, the thing is, uh, you, know, you might test your test with the production code, uh, intentionally changing the production code and saying that test should fail, run the test. If it doesn't fail, something's wrong. Yeah. Yes. Entertain myself. Um, so uh, you can't see this, and uh, that's okay. Uh, the, the, the reason why I picked this example into a presentation is that this represents an, a style of um, a style of testing that I, uh, I think not too many people consider. I'm not saying it's a good idea even most of the time, but. Um, I think it's a good idea sometimes. Now, uh, what this stuff does is basically uh, walk through the, uh, the image, starting from one corner point of box one, and like, like looking at the, ne the neighboring pixels, just like brute force walking through uh, the connected pixels that happen to be black until either it's uh, covered all of the possible neighboring pixels, we, uh, locate the boxes, then we follow the line and make sure that there's no gaps. 
you know, we, we might be able to tell the computer how to do that. Whether it makes sense or if, if it's worth the, the effort, you know, maybe most of the time not, but it's still an option. Yes. So uh, if, you, if you have a test mill, it's, uh, it's, it can be a problem with how you wrote your test code, or it can be a problem with the, how you wrote your uh, production code. It's true. True, yeah. We, we shouldn't test uh, other people's code. Um, and in this case, uh, there, there was no third-party API. We're directly using the uh, Java AWT something. Um, but you're, you're very much correct. Yeah. Uh, that probably that's very basic arithmetic. Check slope, find the second point, the fourth triangle. Probably that would help because the AWG API would probably render the line correctly. It's still responsible. Yeah. So uh, one more uh, solution, alternative solution to this would be uh, sort of the golden master approach. We could uh, we could get rid of all of the uh, the sort of uh, algorithm stuff. We could get rid of all of the, oops, the uh, pixel stuff uh, if we just render it once and say, yeah, that looks correct, and then make that a golden master. Save that into a file, and then in your test, you know, render it again, uh, like here. But just compare it to the whatever the, the golden master is on disk. If you change. Uh, something that changes the appearance of the boxes or the line or the, the shape or size of things, you, you'd have to probably re-evaluate the, uh, the correctness of the render. Uh, but it might be okay if, if, you, if you manage to isolate that, that uh, the diagram you're drawing uh, to a small enough that you can, you can trust that it, it works and it doesn't break too often or it doesn't change too often. So that, that's also a, another alternative that we could do. But personally, I found this very entertaining, so I, I wanted to do this. So uh, uh, that was the, uh, the set of samples. Uh, this is just uh, eight samples, eight smells. Uh, some of them are very much related. There's a bunch of more in the book uh, that's, it, apparently it's not available yet. I mean, not in, in print, but you can get an ebook very easily already today. Uh, if you want to uh, follow me on, on Twitter, I'm Lasse Koskala. Um, I don't have an email here, but uh, I'd be happy to discuss this over email. I, uh, I won't respond quickly, but I will. So uh, I'd be happy to continue discussions. We still have a few minutes left if you have questions about the, uh, the smells uh, or the other smells in the book. Um, it's the, I have no idea. So the, the publisher is Manning Publications and uh, all of their uh, book covers are from this uh, set of old pictures that the, the publisher, the, the, pr the owner of the company bought at some point. He bought the rights to these pictures. And uh, I guess he keeps them in a safe somewhere and whenever they publish a new book, I, the, the biggest decision he makes is really uh, which image will I use? Uh, personally, I, I kind of wish that they would you know, run out of pictures, but you know, I like the f I like the mustache. But there's no relation to the Not really, no. Right. 
All right. Uh, thank you. Um, I hope this was useful, and I, I hope that I sparked an interest in, in, in you looking at your test code a bit, uh, maybe uh, with slightly different eyes. Um, and if, if you'd like help, I'm sure you, you can find a, another person with the same passion very close to you. Thank you.